Traveling from Shaker Heights, Ohio, Marissa Silver has become one of the foremost short story writers of the current literary world. She's proved her ability to be successful in multiple fields through her history of screenwriting and directing films, which has metamorphosed to the adept manipulations of language put forth in her current body of work, short stories and novels. Many of her short works have been published in The New Yorker, and her collection Babe in Paradise has been the recipient of numerous awards, including the LA Times Best Book of the Year and the New York Times Notable Book of the Year. She was also awarded the O. Henry Prize in 2009 for her story The Visitor, taken from the short story collection Alone With You. Her vividly detailed, graceful descriptions, often particularly noted in reviews of her first novel, No Direction Home, are matched only by the realism of her characters. Silver currently resides in Los Angeles with her family and published her most recent novel, Mary Coyne, earlier this year. When asked about her thoughts on short story writing, Silver replied, To me, stories have the possibility of exploring states of being rather than large arcs of multi-layered action. Most important for me, I want to come to the end of a story with the beginning of understanding. I want the story to end, and I want my mind to vault beyond its plastic limits into the unanswered mysteries the story reveals. Reading Silver's work, one experiences perhaps that same sense of wonder and transcendence of the stylistic confines of storytelling. Please join me in welcoming Marissa Silver. Um, thank you for having me, first of all. It's such a pleasure to be here, and, and I'm really grateful for the invitation. Um, the, I, I, probably a lot of you write short stories, but um, not thinking of that, I brought my most recent novel to read from, but that's okay. We can still talk about short stories if you want to in the question and answer section. Um, this is a novel that was published in March called Mary Coyne, and um, as you can tell from the very well-known photograph, it's um, sort of a fictional... Uh, rendering of that photograph and, and the sort of stories surrounding the taking of that photograph and the legacy of that famous migrant mother photograph from the Depression. Um, what I did was um, took this story and um, I'm sorry, <laughs> I just got distracted by something. I, I sort of looked at this photograph for a very long time and I um, then really kind of invented a possible narrative around it. I didn't want to tell the true story. I don't, it's not historical fiction in that sense. It's really kind of almost, I thought of it as sampling, like in music where you take bits of real music and then you create something new out of it. That's kind of what I was doing with this. I was taking something real and some real history and some real facts of the lives of the people involved and then inventing around that, elaborating and making a fictional universe that could suggest a possibility and also suggest maybe broader themes that, that, um, that the, that the picture in, encompasses. So I'm gonna read you a little bit from that. Um, the story is told in three points of view. It's the, the, the woman in the photograph in the book is called Mary Coyne. Um, the woman who takes the photograph is called Vera Dare. And there's a third point of view, um, a, a contemporary character, a historian named Walker Dodge. And I'm actually not gonna read from uh, a part of him. I'm just gonna read you a little bit from the two different women's points of view. Um, so this comes from the center of the book, and it's this is the beginning part is from Mary's point of view. Uh, it's in 1936. She's moved from California, from Oklahoma. I'm sorry, um, to California in the uh, early 20s. She's had seven children, um, and now she's a migrant farmer in the heart of the Depression. So you can imagine the world that she's existing in, sort of abject poverty. Nipomo, California, 1936. They had been traveling together for two months. During that time, they had worked only 14 days between them. After a spate of unemployment, something would turn inside Earl, and he would grow restless and disappear, sometimes for a few days. When the children asked after him, she would make up excuses that he had gone looking for work or that he had a sick relative li living that he needed to visit. The relief she felt when he returned scared her. One of these times he would be gone for good, and she needed to remain strong in the belief that she could do this thing on her own. For the first time in her life, she was careful at night, making sure that he was outside her before he let go. She wanted no possibilities between them. The Hudson had broken down the night before outside Napomo near a pea field. The baby had a chesty cough. It would not do to have him sleep out of doors in the tent, so everyone slept cramped inside the car. When Mary woke, the windows were fogged, and she wiped her sleeve on the windshield. The hood of the car was up, and Earl was bent over the engine. She put her lips to the baby's forehead. He was warm. His eyes were glassy. She opened the car door and stepped outside, tucking him beneath her coat. Her shoes broke through a th thin layer of frost. A cold wind carried voices from the clutter of shacks in the picker's camp. 
She would find out if someone there had medicine they were willing to give her. She could ask about jobs too. There was no hiring sign, but it was cold and people could be sick. There might be at least a day or two of work for Earl. The radiator is busted, he said. You wouldn't happen to know how, how to fix it, she said. His look was his answer. Ellie came out of the car, pulling on her coat. Come with me, Mary said to her daughter. Let's see the new people. Ellie shrugged and followed slowly, her eyes scanning the ground. Mary had taught Trevor and Ellie how to judge the smell of dead birds to determine their freshness. The birds were keeping them going now, birds and whatever winter produce fell off the trucks. Ellie was listless, all of Mary's children were. They were down to one hot meal a day, but she knew the dullness signified a worse kind of vacancy. At the camp, people dismantled tents and roped mattresses to the tops of cars. Others hoisted their bundles and suitcases and walked toward the road. That's not right, Mary said. What's not right, Ellie said. The fields were empty. Mary spoke to a woman and learned that an overnight frost had killed off the peas. All of the workers had been let go. The baby coughed and then moaned. His cheeks were splotchy and red, and Mary could feel the heat coming off him. No one, she asked, had medicine, or if they did, they were not willing to give it to a stranger. She and Ellie returned to the car. He's burning up, Mary said to Earl. We've got to get somewhere warm. I guess I'll go then, he said. And there it was, what she had been waiting for. Even though she had steeled herself to the eventuality of his permanent departure, she could sense that it would undo her. Trevor, how's your energy holding up, Earl said. Don't you dare do that, she said sharply. Do what? He's just 13 years old. He can't take the load of this family himself. I always have and I always will, with or without you. Go if you're going and leave my boy alone. He stared at her. She wished he would just gather his rucksack and his suitcase and leave. She was tired of pretending that she could make a family for her kids. She was tired of sex, tired of need. I thought he could help me take this radiator into town so we could get it fixed, Earl said quietly. She knew she had hurt him, but she could not ignore that it felt good to release all her exhaustion and worry on him, to stab him with his weakness. She said nothing as he and Trevor lifted the radiator and started down the road. Ray and June ran after them, but Mary was too tired to call them back. She figured it would take Earl and the kids a good hour to walk to Nipomo. Once in town, there was no telling how long it would be before they found someone to fix the radiator for the little money <laughs> Earl had on him. Ellie wanted to hunt for dead birds, but Mary told her to stay close. There were still people in the camp, unhappy, hungry people who had no work. It was not a place for a girl to go wandering off by herself. And Mary wanted to Ellie near. She felt exposed by the side of the road with no means of leaving if that collective misery should turn into anger. Delia, Della held the baby in the front seat of the car while Ellie and Mary staked the two knobby poles into the ground and set up the tent. Ellie untied the rocking chair and the stool from the roof of, of the car. Mary pulled the stool underneath the tarp to get out of the cold, then called for Della to bring her the baby. His fever had risen. James and Della had both started coughing too. Mary thought about making a fire and setting water to boil. The children could sip hot water. But she'd have to send Ellie to look for ditch water, and she didn't know if Della and James would be able to find wood dry enough to hold a flame. A car passed, moving up the highway from the south at a speed that suggested the driver was so eager to get someplace that he didn't care that driving fast used up more gas than driving slowly. Mary tried to think back to a time when she'd been eager to reach a place. Those first few trips to a new mill town had been filled with anticipation knowing she'd have a company cabin to make into a home, that there'd be school for the kids, that Toby's brothers and their wives would be with her. But the last time she could really recall pure, uncompromised excitement about getting somewhere was when she ran across her mother's farm through the gum trees to meet Toby, already imagining his hands on her, his greedy, sloppy enthusiasm, his stunned pleasure. She knew the baby needed to drink if his fever was going to go down, but, she, but he refused her breast. She held the back of his head and pushed her nipple at his lips. He started crying, and she snapped at him, and then she regretted those words. She knew Toby was right, and that a child understood no matter how small he was. James and Della played with a swag of rope tied around the tent pole. Ellie sat in the rocker, braiding her hair. The baby was so hot. Mary loosened the blanket around him, but then worried that he would catch a chill. A car passed from the north. Mary recognized it as the same one that had driven by not five minutes before. This time she saw that it was a woman at the wheel. She wore a funny hat that tilted on her head like a Necco wafer. The candy June was so fond of, even though the other children said it tasted like dirt. 
The car slowed as the woman started it off, uh, steered it off the road, pulling up and parking right alongside the Hudson. She stepped out of the driver's seat, adjusting the hat on her head. She went around to the trunk, opened it, and took out a camera. She limped when she walked. A little woman with a funny hat and a limp. Mary would tell the story to the others when they returned. My name is Vera Dare, she said. All right, Mary said. Do you mind if I take your picture? What for? I work for the government. I'm not with any strikers, if that's what you think. I don't want trouble. No, that's not it. I take pictures to show the government how things are so that they will help people like you. People like you. Mary did not have the energy to speak. Della and James stood near her, wary of the stranger. Ellie stayed in the rocker, playing with her hair. Would it be all right then, the woman said. The baby let out a cry. Mary shifted him around in her lap. Maybe he'd take the other nipple. I guess, she said, hardly paying attention. All she could think about was her baby and getting liquid into him so that he didn't dry up. I've got to feed this baby. Go ahead, the woman said. Mary was coaxing her nipple into his mouth when she heard the click of the camera. She looked up, surprised. What was it about some things happening that made it seem almost unbelievable that they had happened <clears throat> at all? It was like when she watched Ray tearing off at such a speed that she knew he would trip and fall. And then when he did fall, she would have to convince herself that this small accident had, in fact, occurred and that she had not invented it. She wanted to tell the lady to stop what she was doing, but it was already done. And what was the difference, anyway? Mary felt the baby's lips go flaccid around her skin. She shook him a little bit to try to get him to focus, but she knew it would do no good. The woman stepped forward and took another picture. How old are you, if I may ask, she said. Thirty-two, Mary said. She licked her finger and rubbed it over the baby's dry lips. The woman moved forward and took another picture. How many children do you have? You never knew what a stranger's questions really meant. How many kids do you have could mean how much food do you have with you, and if I send my kids by at supper time, will you feed them? Where is your man might mean is there anybody to protect you, or would you be easy to rob? Seven, Mary said. Why had she answered? The woman squinted at Mary as if she was trying to see something particular, the way Mary did when she searched for a knit in her children's hair. The woman held the camera at her chest and peered down into the eyepiece. She seemed dissatisfied. She moved to the right. Mary felt self-conscious as if she were failing at something she hadn't even known she was trying to achieve. Where are the others, the woman said as she focused her camera. Don't answer. Radiators busted. They went into town to get it fixed. What was it about this woman and her camera that made it seem like she had the right to know everything about Mary's life? As the woman repositioned herself one foot, then two feet closer, Mary felt trapped. So dug in, there was no way out. Food is scarce, the woman said. That's right. What do you live on? Killed birds and frozen vegetables. You have much work lately? Not lately. That's the story I hear everywhere I go, the woman said, distracted by some mechanical problem with her camera the story, Mary thought. A poor woman holding a sick baby, two sniveling children and a girl wishing she had movie star hair. What story would she tell that woman? I have a man who will leave me one day. I have a girl who likes Necco wafers. The baby let out a miserable cry. She wished she had asked Earl to pick up some medicine in town, but she'd been flustered when, he'd wrong when she'd wrongly accused him of wanting to abandon her, and she hadn't thought clearly. And how would he have enough money to pay for the car and the medicine? She should have told him to forget about the radiator, that the baby was more important. But without a car, there was no chance of work. And with no work, there was no way to pay for the fever-reducing syrup this baby needed. There was all this useless thinking, what if? As if there were some other choice to make when there were no more choices. There was only whatever was going to happen next. Maybe I can get the little ones to turn around, the lady said. That's right, just turn around so you're not looking at me. One of you on each side of your mama, just like that. Della and James did as they were told and faced away from the camera. James leaned into Mary's shoulder to let her know he was there, her protector, her silent guardian. The, ma the baby made a small mewling sound. Mary put her hand to her chin and worried the tiny scar that remained from when her mother had held four quarters in her hand and cut her across the jaw. She looked away. The woman took a photograph. Thank you, she said. I've got what I need. She turned and limped back to her car. Um, and then I'm just going to read you a tiny bit from um, Vera's point of view. The first half of the book takes place when the women are girls up until the point where the photograph is taken. 
And then the second half of the book takes place when they're both old women. Uh, so Vera is at the end of her life. She's quite sick and she's about to die. And she wakes up in the middle of the night and she goes into the living room. She searched for the photo. She never liked to display her work around the house. There was something unseemly about doing such a thing, like leaving your drying brassiere hanging on the shower rod for guests to see. <laughs> she finally found it in the living room among a group of framed uh, pictures stacked upright against a wall. As she brushed the dust off the glass with the sleeve of her nightgown, she remembered how excited Miller and Philip became whenever she or Everett pulled into a filling station on the long trips to and from Taos. The boys stopped fighting while they watched the attendant scrape away road dust and bird droppings from the windshield with his rubber edge tool. She could still picture their amazed expressions as they saw a more sharply brilliant world reveal itself through the windshield. That was the thing about looking through frames. You saw something you had seen before, maybe hundreds of times, but you noticed it differently. She set the picture against the wall and sat opposite it. The photograph embarrassed her. It was not that she didn't think it was a good image. It was. She had made plenty of poor ones in her career, and she knew the difference. She'd found the right distance between herself and her subject this time. She'd gotten just close enough to the woman and her children so that she had not forced a point of view by being too aggressive in angle or by including ironic juxtapositions. The picture had been effective because every single person who had looked at it had to decide whose side he was on. But over time, it had been so reproduced, so co-opted, so burdened with the obligation to represent an entire era, that it had become something both more and less than the image she had taken that day. It reminded her of an over-decorated soldier who looks less like a hero and more like a little boy playing dress-up. Sometimes when she came across the image in a book or an article, she averted her eyes. Like the woman in the picture. Why did she suddenly, at that last moment, turn her gaze away from the camera? Often people Vera photographed asked her how she wanted them to look or stand, should they comb their hair or put on another dress. She told them they should do whatever made them feel comfortable. As much as she liked a photo that captured some unconscious moment, she also appreciated the formality of the pose. Maybe this was the effect of all her years working in the studio. People talked about the truth as being something you had to steal when the subject was unaware. The phrase was, after all, taking a picture. But the truth was as much in the way a woman arranged her hair or rubbed a stain off her child's chin before allowing the picture to be taken. The truth was often a performance of an idea of truth. Why did the woman look away? The question was vexing. Maybe she had lost her nerve and this turning away was a willful disappearance, the way a child covers his eyes and believes no one can see him. Perhaps she thought Vera pitied her. Vera hoped that wasn't the case. Pity was a horrible thing. Thank you. So, have at it. <laughs> what a surprise. Yes? <laughs> How does the process of creating a completely fictional character differ from the process of creating a character that's based upon a real person? That's a great, great question. Um, well, I guess in the, in the big sense, it doesn't differ at all. Because for me, the way I create characters is I start with a very a shred of something. Maybe it's the color of hair, or maybe it's a body type, or a certain way of speaking. I mean, certain things, age and sex and all that. But it's really a very small amount of information. And I, I sometimes think of, of creating character as a lot like meeting a person in real life. You know, you meet somebody at a party, and you have some very scant interchange with them, and you develop a couple of ideas about them. Maybe they have an accent, or maybe they are funny, or maybe they're, you know, boring, or whatever it is. You begin, you, you make a sort of instant judgment about their character. And that's kind of the way it is in the very beginning for me. I have this kind of very, maybe kind of lumbering idea of what, of who the characters are. But then as I begin to put the characters into relationship with other characters, and I begin to have them have to behave in certain ways, I throw action in their path and then I decide how they behave, then I begin to refine my understanding of who they might be. It's in the same way that if I were getting to know that person at the party a little bit more, the next time we went out, I would have more of a, a, a kind of nuanced understanding and my idea of them would begin to sort of get textured. So for me, it's a really long process. It takes almost an entire book 
to get to know a character um, because all of the actions that happen in the book and how they behave shouldn't be predetermined. You know, people are, what the great thing about human nature is that it's completely unpredictable. And so if you have a character who is behaving in a way that you could predict, it's going to be um, actually not that real. It's going to feel very two-dimensional and flat because that's not really the nature of human beings. Human beings surprise you constantly in small ways and large ways. So um, it's really a matter of me feeling my way through each and every scene. And as the character, as you know, I, I decide how the character behaves in that scene or in that relationship or in that instance, I get to know her more and I get to know her more. Um, the difference in having a, a real character to base it on it, um, is really one of, for me, it was about permission. Because both of these women were real. You know, Flor uh, Vera Dare is based on the photographer Dorothea Lange, who was a very famous um, photographer in the early part of the, in mid part of the 20th century. And um, the woman in the photograph is a real woman. Her name was Florence Owens Thompson. And although not a lot is known about her, there is a little bit to be known about her. Um, there's a ton to know about Dorothea Lange. People have written biographies about her, and she's you know talked about in every history of photography in the 20th century, and she's a very important photographer. So part of what was hard was I both wanted to use facts from these women's lives, but then I needed permission to invent. And so um, I sort of did my you know did a lot of research uh, at the very beginning about the th their lives, and then I decided what of their lives I wanted to use. And then I kind of had to change their names and in a funny way, put them away and then just see them as inve pure invention so that I could create their emotional lives because we don't know what people felt or thought in any given instance. We might know what they said if they've been quoted or we might know what they did if their actions have been um, recorded, but we don't know, we have no access to their interiors. But a book, a novel, a short story, you have to have access to your character's interiors and it has to feel free. It can't, for me, it, 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 it can't feel hamstrung by reality um, or by a sense of um, over uh, decorousness, worrying about you know, what the real character. I had to really feel like I've invented these two women. So for me, it was a question of changing their names, you know, I don't see them as the way the real people look in my mind. I didn't, I didn't keep their pictures. And this picture I sort of put away after a while. I needed to sort of be free from the reality. But different, you know, writers do it in different ways. I mean, there's one, I mean, Don DeLillo wrote a whole book about Lee Harvey Oswald, Libra, and he uses the name Lee Harvey Oswald and he uses a lot of real people. So I think different writers tackle that problem differently. And, but for me, it was a question of sort of, Full, needing to sort of fully disengage from the real women and, and then just treat them as though they were just as, as fabricated as any character that I could write. That was a long answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the dialogue in this novel, I think, is really extraordinary. It's, I mean, it's, both, it's really deceptively simple and doesn't have a, um, doesn't, there's no sense of, you know, I, I'm speaking history. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how you, heard the dialogue and how, how yeah. you got to that place? Well, I would say in general, in my writing, I tend not to speechify much. Um, I tend, people don't tend to say much when they say anything. Mm -hmm. Probably because I don't usually, I mean, this is an anomaly in this moment <laughs> when I'm blabbering along, but um, most people don't speak in speeches, you know? I mean, there are authors, again, DeLillo is a great example, um, who, their, their dialogue is almost a heightened version of reality because the characters do speak in these kind of elaborate speeches almost. But for me, um, I really, I'm a, I'm a stripper away of stuff and people don't, don't say very much. And it really has nothing to do with how educated they are or anything. And they just, I mean, I guess it's also because I'm also a believer that for me, character is a combination of language and action, and that those two, sometimes those things are very um, in contra contradictory to one another. And that the things that people say is not necessarily, uh, it, it, it's not the truth. It's some, you know, it's some kind of, it's some, it lies somewhere in the, what they say, what they do, and then something else. Um, so, so I, and the other thing I do is when I'm writing, I, um, everything has to, no, no character should be, there should be nothing expository. You know, do you, that means, and I, excuse me if I'm being condescending, but you know, for me, it, it's not, you don't want people to be telling you ideas. You want people to be reacting on a purely emotional level 
and whatever ideas come through those very uh, character-driven emotions are the I big ideas of your book. But you don't, I shouldn't say you don't, I'm, I'll talk about me. I don't. Um, I don't tend to go towards fiction that is, I, that's idea-driven from the start. The ideas are sort of the byproduct of very close work with character. So, um, so they're really not trying to say anything in a funny way. They're not, you know, I mean, in that scene that I just read where, where Mary is talking to Vera, you know, what she's really doing, she's trying to feed her baby. This woman's here. She can't quite get a grip of what's going on. She doesn't, she's never had her photograph taken. You know, it's like, so it's really her, her, what's motivating her is this kind of confusion and this desire to feed her baby. So that's what is motivating in her dialogue. So her dialogue is going to be very distracted and it's going to be very clipped and it's not, she's not interested in this woman. She's not going to say, who are you and where are you from? And, you know, she's, she's, it's, and she's being invaded. So it's, you know, so I guess it's really about sitting very close to the character's emotion at the moment that it's happening and trying to be very clear about um, the, the, what they say is an expression of their emotion at that instant. Sorry, I just, I have to yes, more. It's just because the question of how that's influenced by your film experience, by your mm. directing experience, I, is... I would say that um, my fiction is, is, how is my fiction? People always ask me this, and I, I, I don't really... Um, you know, the craft of, of filmmaking and the craft of fiction is not so different. You know, you're dealing with all the same issues. You're dealing with um, character, dialogue, authority, narrative distance so narrative distance in a, in a in a piece of fiction is going to be are you close to your character are you you know uh, omni um, you know are you looking from above are you in and out of people's consciousness in filmmaking that's about um the distance the camera is from a character so a lot of those considerations are really similar and in terms of cutting moving a story along jumping time you know time is such a critical thing in fiction how time is dealt with i mean in some ways fiction is really just about time and so um i so and and so that those considerations are, are really similar so i don't know that it was influenced i don't know if i've never been a filmmaker if it would be any different i i just you know i don't feel that they're all that different yeah i'm not sure that i completely understood one of the last things that you remarked which was that speaking of the character the two women subject and photographer that whether that you are trying to say anything with by what they said or that they weren't trying to say anything in terms of meaning because this story which i have not read i regret to say thus far at any rate but it has such a profound uh, moral core to it that is the i for years was involved in assigning photographers to photograph people and situations and the obligation of the photographer toward his or her subject is a fascinating thing. What do you owe that subject? Exactly. If anything? Right. And whether that concerned you at all and conceived You know, it concerned me. But I mean it's and it's so much about what the book is about. But I guess what I'm trying to get at is that for me, if I start with the idea, then the piece of fiction becomes very didactic. And it doesn't take off as a kind of is a piece of fiction and when I think when a reader I mean I think we all have the experience of reading books where we feel like the author is trying to ground in their point and and when we read books like that I think that they don't um, they might be interesting on an intellectual level but I feel like they don't necessarily get somewhere super deep so what I try to do is you know obviously I go into a book because I think oh there's some interesting stuff here there's interesting thematic ideas but then I try to put that aside and I just try to focus really closely on the characters in the situations that I put them in and then I let the themes speak for themselves so I don't try to put ideas into characters mouths um, you know in the the little piece I read uh, Vera the older Vera she talks about um, not you know the how she feels that photograph you know how why she thinks it's a good photograph so that's not so didactic as it is it's very much part of her wanting to wrestle with this idea of you know why is this has this photograph run her life and you know she's trying to figure out for herself emotionally what the legacy of this photograph is so i guess a lot of it is just trying to let the ideas speak for themselves and not trying to speak to the ideas there, uh, there was a point in the earlier section that you read uh, from Vera's point of view, mm -hmm. sorry, from Mary's mm -hmm. point of view, really, 
and which the authorial narrator uh, suddenly, to me, seemed to speak in a different tone or voice in a way. You, you said, I think, I tried to scribble down the, the words that, uh, what was it about this woman that gave her the right? Well, and, and that, that that seems authorial to you, but I think it's what Mary was the, thinking. Now the, the author is taking a different stance toward her characters here in a way. Right up to that point in what you read, it was direct narration of what they were doing, what they said, but this is now a statement from, from the, the mind of the narrator. I don't think of it that way. I think it's a statement from Mary that she's she's feeling very from pressured Mary. to say things, and she's wondering what about the situation is making her say things. I mean, Mary's a very thoughtful person, and she's a very um, intuitive person. So I think that in but, but, but that's, that's interesting. I missed it. That's, that that clarifies something very important for me. But. We're inside Mary's mind now, and you're telling us what she's thinking about this. Yeah, in this book, we're always inside the mind of the characters. But, but have you been doing that right along? In this? Yes. You have. Been. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? I think it's a wonderful idea of being based on a very famous photograph. Who are these people, and what about them? And, and yeah, I mean. You know, when I, when I, uh, the reason I wrote the book was because I, I'd seen this photograph billions of times, as I'm sure all of you have in textbooks whenever you read, you know, learn about the Depression, this photograph is there. And I was at a museum about uh, four years ago and I saw the photograph again in an exhibit and I went over to the photograph and, and it said on the curatorial label, it said that the woman in the photograph had not revealed her identity until she was sick and dying and needed money for her health care. And I was so bowled over by that piece of information because I just thought, here's a woman who's arguably one of the most famous faces in photography of the 20th century, international. I mean, everyone knows, maybe the younger generation doesn't, but our old people. <laughs> but, um, you know, and I thought, and she never claimed it, you know, and especially in our day and age where people are claiming, you know, Kardashianville, you know, it's like, you know, I'm famous for, you know, having worn pink shoes. And, and you know, and it was just such a profound piece of, it was stunning. And I just, a million questions came to my mind. And I thought, I want to understand, or at least I want to understand from my, you know, I want an understanding of why somebody would make that choice. What was her relationship? Was she embarrassed by it? Or was she ashamed? Or was she sick of it? Or was she just completely wasn't important to her? You know, what was her relationship to it? And I feel like whenever I begin a book or a short story, it always has to begin with a question. There always has to be something to me that I, that I want to find out the answer to. Um, whether it's a relationship between two people, whether it's, you know, how did somebody get here? Whatever it is, it has to be something that I'm curious about and that I feel like um, it's going to take me a journey to try to understand. And also something that I don't think ultimately I will answer. So I think that when I write, um, I'm not looking for answers. I'm just looking to explore the questions in ways that are powerful. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just intrigued what you were saying about um, that directing and writing were similar to you. But I, I think, you know, when you're writing, you're in a, the environment you're in, you're by yourself. Mm. And then when you're directing, you're in front of an audience immediately. Right. So do you have a preference? Of, of oh, completely. I mean, I haven't directed for many, many moons, and I don't really ever uh, my next want to again. <laughs> the project in mind. Yeah, I mean, I directed in my 20s, and I, I, um, I came came out to California and I directed about four feature films and um, it was a it was an it, it was a great experience it's what I wanted to do it's what I started out wanting to do when I was young and my mom's a director and I you know that was what my dream was um, and the more I did it um, the more I felt like I was getting farther and farther away from stories that were really the ones that I cared about telling. I mean, you all go to the movies and you see, I mean, every once in a while you see a very personal film or you see something that really has a stamp of a director. Um, you know, that's the rare film and that's not the ones that are usually made. And I felt like um, the stories that I cared about were much smaller than, you know, were gonna be made um, on film or more, more, more maybe a little darker. Um, so I just kind of felt like at a certain point that I was, I was telling, doing what I wanted to do, which was to tell stories, but I was in the wrong medium. 
And um, so I stopped and I went to graduate school like you all are and um, and sort of dove into writing stories. And for me, it's a much, you know, I mean, for many reasons, it's, it, you know, not because I can tell stories that I want to tell and no one's telling me that I can't and no one has to, you know, the other thing about making movies is somebody has to give you a lot of money to do it so they don't mm -hmm. let you do a lot of what you want to do. Um, and the other thing is that I, t turns out I actually like being by myself in my room rather than on a set with 80 people t asking me what to do next, that that wasn't my comfort zone and that wasn't where I felt freest and, um, and most kind of creative. So it's, it was a good choice for me. It was not a lucrative choice, but it was a good choice. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Said that um, in working in fiction, you can work on darker subjects. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I was just trying to parse that for myself, and that could be a comment about the movie making industry and the choices they make when they choose a story. Um, I guess my question is, um, why are the darker subjects compelling for you? Um. Well, you know, I shouldn't even. I don't even think of them as being particularly dark. I mean, people think of them as being dark because they're not happy or I don't know. Um, I don't know. I don't know why the things that compel me compel me. That would take years of therapy or something. <laughs> <you know? laughs> um, but I, I guess um, uh, I guess the things that I tend towards are, are questions of human connection and the difficulties of it. And um, I mean, my last collection of stories is called Alone With You, which is sort of sums up basically my, you know, things. So I, I seem to always be attracted to stories that are um, about, about that. Um, and people think of that as being dark. I think about it as being life, you know. So I guess what's dark for some people is actually what I just see. You know, that's the world. And, you know, and also I guess what I'm really compelled by and that, you know, certainly came out in this was I'm sort of, you know, endurance, you know how people endure under whether both emotionally in relationships in big picture ways like with this you know in terms of economic deprivation i mean that is really something that just compels me you know what does it take for a person to endure because we do you know you look at the newspaper every day and you see the pictures of devastation in one part of the world or another and yet people are dragging their water jug to the refugee you know people endure and so that really compels me so i don't you know i don't know and I don't even know what a happy subject is, really. I mean, because if you get into anything deeply enough and you understand the characters in a complex way, it can't be, you know, some kind of idea of happy, you know, People Magazine idea of happiness. It's <laughs> got to be complicated and, and all shades, light and dark. So I don't know. I mean, I think I just go, you know, I think as a writer, you have to go towards the things that move you and that make you feel emotional. And um, those are just, so those are the subjects that I choose, the ones that, you know, I think of tons of things, you know, maybe that'd be a good story. And then I think I, it doesn't go anywhere with me. It doesn't stir me up. So it's, I've got to be stirred up to want to write something. Um, so that's, yeah. Since you start with character, it sounds like, do you find in the process of writing that you go to places that you were, that were perfectly unexpected? Well, you know, it's funny, people, writer, writers always talk about, you know, my characters went here. It's like, I'm writing it, you know, it's like, <laughs> I, you know, so it's, I, I guess I, I sort of, I don't kind of buy into that whole mystical, magical, like, oh, I, my character went here and I followed her, you know, it's like, no, I wrote but that. Have a preconceived notion no, I mean, the one, one thing that I will say is, um, if, if, the, if what the characters doing feels true to me, then it doesn't surprise me because I feel like, as I said earlier, human nature is so various and so complicated and, and what people do is constantly unexpected. So that just feels true and real to me. So when a character does something that doesn't feel real to me, that's unexpected and wrong. But um, I think that, uh, so no, I never am really surprised, but I, but I also don't ever know. And I think one of the things that I feel really strongly about when I write is that if I know, I don't do it, <laughs> you know, because I feel like if I know, then it's going to be unsurprising for the, for the reader. So when I start a story or I start a novel, I 
and it's hard for me because I'm kind of a controlling person and I am not very patient and I want to know that things are going to work, but I don't know where it's headed. I don't know how it's going to end up. I don't know what the emotions will be at the end of it. I don't know if people will have hated each other or loved each other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, 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 I try to maintain that for until the very last moment I've written because I feel like that's where the surprise comes in. If it's surprising to me, then it will be surprising to a reader. And if it's not surprising to me, I know that it will not be surprising or moving to a reader. So I try to keep as much of the unknown, you know, I mean, I knew with this, they meet, you know, they obviously, these women meet at one point and, and I knew that they died, but I didn't know how they would die or what would happen to them in, in those moments. So, you know, but different people write different ways. I mean, people plot out and, and you know, have, so that's just my, my way of doing it, you know, so, but um, I, I sometimes wish that I were someone who had more of a sense of where I was going. It'd be a lot less scary. But it's, you know, that's the way I do it. Is it the same with your novels? Is it the yeah. Story? Yeah, I mean, very much so. You know, a story is a, you know, I mean, they're two such different forms. I don't know, I'm sure some of you guys are writing stories, some of you are writing novels. Um, but, but to me, they have the same kind of basic requirement in that they both have to contain a universe and they both have to um, be unexpected. So your starting point then would be character, and you're not entirely or situation. Or situation. Yeah, I mean, situation and character are sort of inextric inextricable. It's like a person in a situation. Sometimes, uh, but I have started with place. I wrote a novel called *The God of War*, mm -hmm. and it takes place in this particular environment in California called the Salton Sea. And I started with that place because it was so compelling to me and strange. It's like Appalachia in the West, and I kept thinking, who lives here and why and how and what and then began to build story around it so it, it depends but usually it's character usually it's somebody in a situation yes Hi, you talk a lot about what it's like the process of creating what does it feel like to read the finished result? you know that's one of the great sadnesses because i feel like i'm never going to have the experience of reading my work like you might you know, I'm never going to get to read it fresh, and I'm never going to get to approach it as as a as a reader would, I, like the way I read other people's books. And so I, I don't. So when I read through my stuff, I'm you know it's kind of a it's like harrowing because I'm thinking about you know the craft and the, does this work and does that work and how did I do that? You know, I'm th I'm really thinking through it on a very craft level, like a little you know mechanic in the car engine. So I don't, I, you know, sometimes I think, God, what would it take to like, you know, how approach my book like a reader? I'll, I'll never have that experience. And I tend not to read my old work because I just think, Ugh. you know, it might, <laughs> it might be like looking at a photograph of yourself in the, you know, when your hair was horrible in the tenure, you know, in the seventies or the eighties. And, um, so yeah, that's a weird thing. I mean, you know, one thing about writing a, a novel or a story is I feel like the writing of it and the making of the book or the story is really half the job and the other half is what the reader brings to it and and what they supply from their own subjectivity and their own experience and that's going to be different for every single reader and that's the that's the hundred percent of the of the job but I'm sort of only available to 50 percent of it and the other part of it is sort of you know I hear from readers which is great but I'm never in their bed with them while they're in their body while they're <laughs> experiencing it um, although I had this great experience on the airplane over, I was sitting down and this woman got started talking to me and she asked me what I did and I, you know, we were talking and I said, I'm a novelist and she said, what have you written? And I told her my last book is Mary Coyne and she said, I'm in the middle of it. <laughs> so, you know, like a pathetic writer, I said, well, do you like it? You know? <laughs> Anything else? From the students, no questions? Things that are hard for you, you want to talk about or that you're struggling with? Anything? I know I'm putting you on the spot. OK, yes. Um, since your writing is very like, organic, like you don't know where you're headed, what do you do when you hit the wall? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I feel really horrible. Um, yes. OK, this is what I, I do. And, and I'm sure you've heard this a million times. But it really is true. You have to set yourself a daily quota and you have to do it. And even if you've hit the wall, 
go somewhere else, write a letter, write anything for, you know, how, whether it's an hours thing or, th or it's a page number thing, even if it's a page a day, even if it's a paragraph a day, just do it like a job of work because you will break through ultimately. It, you will get past that thing. Um, and when I hit a wall, what I tend to do is instead of thinking, oh, I have to write the next thing, you know, chronologically or in line, I just skip to whatever has juice. Even if it's some scene I thought of that I think might happen way down the pike or I don't even know, I just write it because you want to be in a place of writing and that will inevitably lead to your figuring out the answer to how to break through that wall. So, you know, it is like being one of those kind of wind up toys that you hit it and you hit it and you hit it, you know, you feel like an idiot. And believe me, I get depressed and, you know, I lie down on my bed and, if, you know, I tell people I'm never going to write another book and all that stuff. But what, when I'm smarter, I say to myself, just go to the thing that, that occurs to you and just write it and don't doesn't matter if it is you know is contiguous to what you've written or if it has anything to do with what you've written because your brain is still working on that problem and the act of writing will activate somehow and and you'll get to the next step and it may be absolutely a, a surprising next step it may not at all be what you thought you were going to need to do so that is my advice but i i and every writer you will ever meet has that experience and it's hard it's really really hard but I do think that giving yourself a daily quota is really um, key. You can't wait around for the inspiration to strike. You can't. It's a job. It's a job of work. It's like a yoga practice. You just have to do it. And the doing of it sometimes releases a lot of unconscious thoughts. Yeah. Um, I'm writing a screenplay for my thesis. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, is it better? You know, I'm starting with an outline and now I'm doing, you know, scenes of dialogue you know, kind of patchworking it, but do you think it would be better if I just wrote a short story and then went back and... A short story of it? Yeah. I mean, I'm just trying to think of, like, is it really okay to just... Yes. Write a screenplay? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Unequivocally, yes. I think the hardest thing about being a writer is be giving yourself permission to do it your way. And, you know, there are no rules. And the best writing it comes out of, you know, ingenuity. And so, yeah, I don't, I think those are two very different things to do. And I think if it's coming to you as a screenplay, you should approach it as a screenplay. I don't think that, and, you know, I mean, the great, you know, screenplays, you don't have to write all the description and that stuff. So you can imagine that and focus on action and dialogue, which is really what the screenplay is about. But, um, yeah, I mean, you know, there's no rules and art can be anything. And it, and it, and the only thing that matter, it, the only thing that stands between somebody not making a piece of art and making it is just saying, Oh, I could do I, That's okay to do. I can do that. And, um, giving yourself permission and you don't have to wait for anybody's permission. So yeah, I would say just go for it. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? That's it. Okay, thank you so much.